Hello and welcome. My name is State Representative Tommy Vitolo, and I'm recording on Brookline Interactive Group. I've got a great guest today, Chris Zanettos, candidate for Congress. As you know, we have a Democratic primary and a Republican primary. Both are on September 1st of this year, and they're competitive. Turnout is going to be really important. I encourage everyone to vote. You can vote by mail. Uh, you can vote in person. Make sure you get out and vote. Uh, but I don't want to spend too much time talking about that. I want to spend my time talking with Chris Zanettos. Uh, so Chris, thank you for, for joining me and, and welcome. And I hope uh, you can just tell us what you've been up to since, I don't know, birth in 2019. What brings us to this point? Sure. Thanks, Tommy. And again, thank you for inviting me and all the other candidates uh, for the Congressional uh, Representative Office here in District 4. I appreciate it. Um, sure. So I'm, I'm a Massachusetts guy. I was born in Boston, uh, grew up in the suburbs, uh, went to school at MIT, um, started and raised my family here in the Boston area and uh, in our district here in District 4. Um, I grew up uh, with a lot of opportunity and um, privileges. Uh, my father uh, emigrated here uh, with $100 in his pocket and a scholarship to a school that went out of business after his first semester. Somehow he and my mother, um, who was uh, also born here in Boston of a Portuguese uh, father who emigrated here from the Azores and uh, someone who's been, whose family had been here for a, a long time, since the 1600s. And, um, you know, they taught me a lot of things, my parents. Um, but one of the most important things was that we have a responsibility and accountability to our community to help it improve and improve life for everyone in it. And, um, and that's uh, really stuck with me. Certainly my parents did that as educators um, and that's what they taught me to do. Now, uh, I went to MIT, as I mentioned, and that sort of propelled me into the tech world um, where after a few years uh, working out for a, a company that was acquired by EMC, um, I eventually started three companies of my own, um, all technology companies, two of them cybersecurity companies, um, and uh, very proud that with a lot of hard work and a lot of help with, from a lot of great teammates, we built some great companies, um, eventually uh, creating hundreds of jobs for people here in Massachusetts um, and a uh, quarter billion dollars of salary for people here in Massachusetts. But you know, along the way, it really became so apparent to me. I, you know, I, I sort of, I, I call it sort of peeled away the layers of uh, ignorance about the obstacles that other people face. And it really became apparent to me how hard it was for some people to access these sort of opportunities, uh, not only the educational, but the job opportunities as well. And along the way, I started with my second company um, working with a school in Jamaica Plain. And we really learned an awful lot about the kids and the challenges they faced um, and you know, brought the kids into the company to learn about what tech jobs that were available, that they were welcome, that we wanted them to join us and be interested in math and science, but also just the, um, you know, the lack of resources, uh, no lab tables, no science tables, et cetera. This eventually led me to start up a nonprofit called STEM Match, which works with um, schools in uh, marginalized communities to connect sixth graders in particular uh, with technology companies to get that exposure to the opportunities that are available to them. But also works with Mass Bay Community College and some great companies like State Street Bank and Harvard Pilgrim Health on their one year cyber certificate program to make an experiential learning process and a program that actually can be a feeder for people to access these great jobs without requiring a four-year college degree, which of course 70% of our people can't afford. So I've been focused a lot on those areas and uh, I've just been very uh, distressed to see these obstacles for people achieving a better life than the generation before them um, just keep on growing. And I've seen our, of course, our wage, uh, our opportunity gaps, these just grow dramatically during a time when we had just such a great economy. And that's really what spurred me um, to look at running for this office is I just feel that um, we just don't have the people in Washington who understand the drivers, the educational drivers and the business and the job drivers that we need to change to reduce these obstacles for people who've been marginalized um, 
from uh, being able to attain uh, these opportunities. And we, and I'm happy to talk further about that, but there are so many opportunities that are just unfilled right now. Sure. So there's a, you know, there's a, there's a lot in there uh, to unpack, right? We, you, you really talked a lot about job creation and development, talked a lot about education and you know, had we not been through the last three plus months of COVID, those are really complex questions. And so what I'd like to do is actually acknowledging COVID, sort of maybe talk more long-term and then we're gonna dial it back to what do those things look like in the short term under COVID? So first sort of more long-term, what should we be doing as a society? What should Congress be doing around workforce development and how do you prioritize who um, on the employer side and who on the employee side is getting that focus? Yeah, uh, so that's a great question. So, um, and looking at the long term, and I very much do want to pull it back to what we have to do today because we've got some harsh realities of today. But I will go actually uh, back before COVID, right? Before COVID, we had 9,000 chronically unfilled jobs here in Massachusetts in cybersecurity. We could not fill them at all. Um, and uh, they went unfilled. Um, and eventually companies might fill them in other parts of the country or even other parts of the world. And the reason that they were unfilled is because companies were consistently out there looking for people with four-year college degrees. And, you know, when I look at our challenges and when I look at the um, opportunity gap, which has created so much frust frustration, disenfranchisement across our country, but in our district and in our state as well, um, the, the real issue is that our businesses have been creating jobs that are accessible to only 30% of our people. And that's just not acceptable. So we have to incent them, we have to challenge them, we have to enable them to create jobs that everyone can access. We have to get the foundational education to people so that they can access those jobs. And these aren't just tech jobs, right? Technology is changing every industry in, the, in our country. It is transforming them. And as I said, you know, the, the businesses have got to create what we are beginning to call new collar jobs. Jobs like cybersecurity, where you don't have to be a math whiz, you don't have to be a science expert, and you don't have to go to a four-year uh, college to actually access it if you have apprenticeships, internships that enable you to get that experiential learning. This is a program that actually, a pilot program that I've created working with Mass Bay and a bunch of great local companies uh, to, uh, to build this sort of pathway uh, to these sort of jobs. But cybersecurity jobs, user experience design, environmental science technicians, biotechnicians, all of those jobs really don't take uh, and require a four-year college degree. So what Congress can do is invest heavily in our post-secondary education and our vocational education um, to enable these one to two-year programs, certify them, focus on the areas where we know we're gonna need jobs. All those areas I mentioned, we have millions of unfilled jobs in, in the United States. So build incentives and challenge companies to create those pathways and work collaboratively with our educational institutions um, to embed that experience in the process. Um, those are things that I think that we can do at the back end of the process. Through the rest of the process through K through 12, we have got to invest like we did back when we were losing the space race against the Russians, which is before my time, but I've read about it, right? Where we invested heavily in math and science education to give the foundation for us actually to win the moon, the, the moon race, uh, to get to be the first to land on the moon. We need to do the same thing today. Um, there, are, there is an opportunity for us to create millions and millions and millions of jobs, some of which are already created, and enable our people now to get access to it. And I think that is the most important investment that our uh, people in Congress can drive. But unfortunately, there are only six people in Congress who have any experience with this part of the economy and technology that drives it. There are more radio talk show hosts than there are technologists in Congress. So one reason that I decided I, I felt compelled to run 
is because I have this experience around creating these jobs around the technology and around the educational approaches that can create these new pathways. We just have to change the type of people we send down. there. Well, you've got me wondering how many public access television show hosts are down in Congress. That's, uh, that's, that's not what I meant. <laughs> that's course. a conversation for another day to be sure. So let's dial it. Let's dial the time period we're thinking about to be much more near term, right? We have just dramatic unemployment across the country, across a wide variety of sectors because of our self-imposed economic and cultural distancing um, and restrictions necessary, in my view, um, to tamp down this virus. How do we get things moving again? And maybe more broadly, how do we find the balance between economic, immediate economic productivity and public health and safety? Oh, wow. There are like four questions in there. I may have to, you'll have to stop me if I haven't covered all of them. Um, but that's a big, big question. Um, so let me start um, with uh, a view of one plus one equals three, right? So I'm also an entrepreneur and I'm the only entrepreneur in this race. Um, and one of the things that we learn as entrepreneurs, uh, and don't tell my uh, old professors at MIT, I said this, um, which is your alma mater too, as I recall, um, one plus one can equal three, right? Um, we believe that we can create something from nothing and that we can create something that everyone can win, with, right? That our investors can win, our staff, our customers, and the community, right? Because typically we're creating these companies to improve the, the community and our life in some way very different than the zero sum game down in Washington. Well, I think this is necessary now with the pandemic, right? I mean, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. We had a trillion dollar deficit last year, the first time ever, massive. This year we're gonna have, I don't know, six to seven trillion dollar deficit, and it's necessary. People, we have to make sure that people, um, particularly those who are from uh, lower income communities have enough money to, feed their family, to clothe their family, um, to have shelter. Unfortunately, once again, those that are um, uh, in the tougher situations in our community are the ones who hit the hardest by this. People who are in jobs where they have to work multiple jobs to support their families, where they're not already earning a, a livable wage. Those, unfortunately, are the people most impacted um, by the layoffs, by the closings of the companies, et cetera as well as, of course, our family-owned businesses, um, which have uh, had a very tough time. So, but I think that we can create a one plus one opportunity if we invest wisely as we drive in, out of this pandemic and the economic disaster that's accompanying it. One way that we can do that is by driving smartly to achieve the goals uh, around uh, climate change and reversing those and achieving zero emissions by 2050. We can invest in things like public transportation and affordable housing nearer where jobs are in a way that improve people's lives, create construction and other jobs, but also reduce our emissions. We can invest in clean energy technologies in the wind farm that's down uh, planned for off of our coast that we hope will continue to get to fruition and all of the uh, of manufacturing and businesses surrounding it. I don't know if you know, actually you probably do know, Right, that every wind turbine in the United States is imported from Europe. Right? Well, why, this is gonna be a growth industry. Why wouldn't we invest in this? Why wouldn't we invest in this in our district in Massachusetts, um, create some incentives to actually start manufacturing uh, turbines here in the United States and in our district. Um, it's gonna be a growth industry. So I think that we can make investments there. There's a lot of talk around investing in infrastructure to create jobs as we come out of this, I wanna make sure that we invest in the most important part of our infrastructure, our people. There will be, as you, as you mentioned, there are millions and millions who are out of work and there will be millions out of work for unfortunately for some time. I've led a company through two major recessions including the 08 Great Recession, supposedly a once in a lifetime event. I know how companies think about this and how they plan um, and grow. And it will be a while before we get back to uh, where we were. In fact, an MIT economist just recently predicted 2030 by the time 
we actually get back to where we were in terms of employment. Well, what should we do? Let's invest in our people. Let's create a GI Bill-like effort to make community college and other training around these new college jobs affordable. And frankly, with a forgivable loan, free. If they go through, they graduate, and they go into the industry, let's forgive their loans. Within two years, the government will make back all the money that they spent on making it a forgivable loan. That's a win-win. Our people can get trained. They can get trained for these new jobs that are high paying that can help them lift up their families. And in the short term, it's not gonna cost us any money. I love it. I think that's, that's really helpful to be talking about that and really bringing together a couple of different areas. Um, one thing we haven't talked about yet, but I know is on, you know, is on everybody's minds is um, how this um, talk about economic development and how talk about COVID um, interplays with the Black Lives Matter movement, right? It's been a huge, huge topic of conversation over the last month and a critically important one. And I think, you know, I can imagine how these things might connect, but I'd like you to, if you could explicitly connect the dots between the things that you've been thinking about since, since long before a month ago, since long before three or four months ago when COVID became our reality, connect the dots between economic development and recovery and the Black Lives Matter movement for us. Sure, I, I'll, I would say that there are a couple of different ways that we have to connect the dots, right? First of all, I would say that I am, you know, I'm hopeful. I mean, the, the past few weeks have been very uh, sad and disturbing, but also I think for me hopeful that we will finally take real action um, to address um, racial prejudice, how it's embedded in our institutions, how it creates obstacles for our fellow citizens um, of color from achieving uh, what I call the American dream that my family has been able to achieve. Um, the ability to have the opportunity to do better than the generation um, before. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it is essential for us to understand that we cannot truly have social justice without economic justice as well, right? So as we look to take this opportunity and drive progress around policing, and I'm fully in support of the Justice and Policing Act that Senators Booker and Harris um, have put forth down in Congress, um, we need to reform our processes and do everything we can to pull as, as much of the embedded racism out of our policing and justice system as possible but we have to go further. If we do not go further to break down the other barriers for people of color to access this opportunity in our country, um, then we're not achieving social justice. And when you look at it, unfortunately, when it comes to the pandemic, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to income, um, our uh, fellow citizens whose skin color is uh, black or brown are far over proportionately uh, counted amongst those that are suffering from poor health care, um, from the, the impact of the pandemic, from poor environment, um, and from other barriers uh, related to income. And I think we have to address all of them. And just one example of just seemingly to some of us might be a small thing, but is so important from uh, the perspective of accessing education is internet access, right? Our, our lower income communities have very poor internet access. Um, and again, those communities are predominantly brown and black. Um, they uh, need that to access the sort of learning. Um, don't tell, uh, I, I won't say which of my kids it was, but one of my kids learned calculus basically on the web, um, even with the great schools that we have in our town. Well, kids in lower income areas and um, the vast majority of our uh, fellow citizens of color, they can't access that. That's unacceptable. The, the government has actually created a subsidy for this uh, through the CARES Act. Fantastic. Um, for com for uh, uh, families of income 135% or lower of the poverty level, you get a subsidy for internet access of $9 a month. Well, that's not going to do anything. We have to break 
all these barriers. And I will tell you, from my own personal journey, working with schools in Boston, uh, with my nonprofit and with my last company, um, it just made apparent to me how many of these things, everywhere I looked, I found these sort of obstacles. And again, um, you know, on top of that, our uh, people of color in our country, they face the additional obstacles of racial prejudice and, and racism that's embedded. So we have to be aggressive to attack all of these to truly get to social and economic justice. And that's what I'm focused on doing. Thank you. And I'm glad you brought up healthcare. And I know you had been uh, talking about it more broadly than just around COVID. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can sort of think through for us more broadly about healthcare, you know, where, where the next Congress should really be focusing efforts around healthcare, whether it's access, whether it's a particular um, scheme to, to pay for healthcare, whether it's a particular affliction. Talk to us about, about what in healthcare you think warrants, uh, warrants where we're going next. Um, so there are a number of areas. So first of all, I, I would share that from my perspective, right, we are the world's richest country. And for us not um, to have millions and millions of Americans covered with health care insurance and have access to quality health care is just a disgrace. We have to have universally available health care insurance and quality health care services accessible. Two different things. Um, I'm a, a strong proponent of truly investing and expanding Obamacare to where it has been planned to be but has been stopped from achieving. Um, we need to provide a safety net for anyone who cannot afford quality health care to get it. Um, I also believe that we should have a public option uh, to enable uh, anyone to join in and that Medicare should be free to negotiate drug prices to drive down these drug prices. Um, so I believe that we have to invest there. But again, I think we've got to recognize that this is a systemic issue. Um, so I learned uh, from working with my last company with 30 of the top hospitals in the US that um, the reality is everyone's getting some level of care. The problem is they're getting the wrong care at the wrong time. And it actually is more expensive for us. We have people with problems that could have been solved earlier with preventative care, but they don't have insurance. So they show up in the emergency office when it's a, an acute problem. And when I talk to my friends who are in administration for some of our top hospitals, they tell me we could save 20% of the cost of this if people actually had preventative care. Um, so we've got to focus on how we ensure everyone has quality preventative care, but we also have to make sure they have access. So many people from lower income areas cannot get to their hospitals effectively and easily or their doctor's offices. They have to take multiple buses, change, change lines, et cetera. So if we improve public transportation, we can actually improve access to health care. We've also got to look at where our hospitals are and invest and in, in give incentives for hospitals to open up in the areas where there is not strong access, which tend to be in our more rural and our lower income urban areas. Um, we also have to look at the issue of food deserts, right? If people can't get access to um, uh, fresh and healthy produce and foods, their health is going to be worse. There are just so many different ways we have to understand um, how we can help our people get access to what they need to to have a healthy and happy life. Chris Zanettos, bottom of the ballot, hopefully at the top of our minds and hearts. Um, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk with us about a wide variety of issues about economic development, uh, about some education reform, about COVID, about healthcare. Uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, it's clear your experiences um, certainly inform your vision for what the MA4 congressperson could be doing in the future. Um, again, thanks for coming on. Thanks for watching on Brookline Interactive Group Television. Uh, and I wish you the best of luck. Uh, it's been a real pleasure getting to know you, and I hope that we, um, we continue to work together.
Thank you, Tommy. I do as well. That's been great joining you. And as I said, thank you for um, this. You worked with all of us on getting signatures as well. And it's a, I think it's a real value to your constituents um, just to help all of us just get our messages out and so people can know who we are. Thank you so much, Chris. Again, I'm Tommy Vitolo. You. You're watching Brookline Interactive Group and have a wonderful democracy. Be well.